Today I'm talking to Dr. Dan Baruch, who's Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Center of Virology and Vaccine Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Um, Dan, thanks for joining us. Uh, you and your team have uh, been in the, in the news a lot and you're developing a vaccine. So I'd love to ask a series of questions about vaccine development in general and, and what you and your team have been doing. But let's just even start out with what makes us believe that a vaccine is even going to work to prevent infection with the coronavirus? Well, thanks, Rowena. Um, we don't know for sure whether a vaccine is going to work for COVID-19. Only large-scale clinical trials will tell us that. But what I can say is that we are cautiously optimistic that the development of a vaccine is possible for several reasons. One of the most important questions for vaccine development is whether there is natural protective immunity. What that means is, are people who get infected with COVID-19 and recover, are those individuals then resistant to reinfection? Are they protected against re-exposure to the virus? Has a vast implications uh, for opening economies and public health strategies, but also it has major implications for a vaccine because it is very well known that if the human body is able to eliminate and um, a defeat a virus, it's generally much easier to make a vaccine. For example, for HIV, uh, there is no evidence of natural protective immunity, and vaccine development for HIV has proven to be very difficult now 30 years into the epidemic. So the hope is that there will be natural protective immunity for COVID-19. We addressed the question in an animal study in rhesus macaques, uh, and I'll emphasize this is an animal study, so we have to be cautious about extrapolating these data to humans. But what we found is that animals that are infected with COVID-19, uh, after they recover, then they are actually uh, protected against re-challenge, demonstrating at least in the animal model that natural protective immunity does indeed exist for this virus. Well, I mean, that's great news. And then the next step, though, is do you know that you can develop a vaccine or design a vaccine that would elicit the same immune responses um, that, that would then end up protecting people against uh, coronavirus? So we did a second study as well, also in the animal model of rhesus macaques, and we developed uh, six prototype vaccines. Now, these are not the vaccines that are currently uh, in or going into clinical trials. We believe we have more potent versions of them for, for human clinical trials. But for initial studies uh, in the animal model, we vaccinated monkeys with these vaccines, and we demonstrated that they did indeed raise neutralizing antibody responses to COVID-19. And following exposure to the virus, the animals were then protected. Some of the animals showed no virus at all after challenge in their nose and in the lungs, and other animals did show some virus, but at lower levels than in the controls. So uh, these studies suggest that the development of a vaccine is going to be possible. And in addition, we observed that there was a correlation between the levels of antibodies induced by the vaccine and the extent of protection. So altogether, these data suggest that um, uh, the vaccines can induce the right types of antibodies and that the levels of antibodies induced is a good biomarker and a good correlate for vaccine development. Now, I know you guys are not going to stop there. For sure, you're going to do trials in humans. Uh, how do those plans look? The vaccines that are reported in our publications from last week uh, are not the vaccines that are going into the clinic. Those are early prototypes. However, as a collaboration with Johnson & Johnson, we have inserted uh, the coronavirus spike proteins into a common cold virus called an adenovirus. Now, it's engineered so that adenovirus does not replicate in humans. And so therefore, it doesn't actually cause any disease itself. So we believe it is very safe. But what the common cold virus does, it is a very efficient way of shuttling the coronavirus spike protein into human cells. So once inside cells, then the protein is made and the body makes an immune response to it. So the hope is that uh, those clinical trials will get underway in the next several months.
Now you had mentioned HIV uh, in some of your earlier comments, and I believe that this vaccine that you want to use in uh, in your patients or in people, sorry, um, to t this coronavirus vaccine is very closely related to some of the work that you've you've been doing for a long time trying to find a vaccine for HIV. Um, what is what's the relationship there between your work in HIV and how you're going about doing this vaccine work for coronavirus? Well, thanks, Romina, for the question. As you know, uh, we've been working uh, both in the development of a vaccine as well as in the development of a cure for HIV for many years now. Um, and so within the scope of research for our HIV work, we've developed a series of vaccine platforms, uh, collaborations with both academic and industry partners, immunologic and virologic uh, capacity in the laboratory, animal model, as well as clinical trial capacity. And all of that brings to bear on the current COVID-19 crisis. In fact, we've applied essentially all of those different parameters and, and, and features of our lab to the development of a COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, for sure, there's no way we could have made uh, progress this quickly uh, without the HIV research that has been ongoing in our group for the last 15 years. Very specifically, the actual vaccine vector, the common cold virus that we're gonna use uh, to, um, uh, for the clinical development program is actually a platform that was built up for HIV research. Hmm. So let's imagine you've finished your clinical trial now, uh, you have some sense of how effective the coronavirus vaccine is, what would be the satisfying number? How many people would it have to protect for you to declare victory and say, this is an effective vaccine? I think it really depends on where the epidemic is at that point. If the epidemic is still uh, really raging by the time uh, we hopefully will get clinical efficacy data, uh, then, uh, th then even a partially effective vaccine could have enormous public health benefits. If the epidemic is largely resolved by that point, then there would probably be a much higher bar for approval of a vaccine such as that. But I should emphasize the flu vaccine that many of us do get every year uh, is only about 50% effective. So there is, there, there is a strong um, uh, precedent for using vaccines that are not 100% effective for, for major public health benefits. Uh, I think the efficacy of these vaccines in humans remains to be seen. Uh, I don't think anybody can predict whether these vaccines will be 50% effective, 95% effective, or 20% effective. Of course, we hope it will be the 95% effective uh, for, for, for the benefit of the world. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, only large-scale rigorous clinical trials can really determine that. Well, and that's the next question I wanted to ask, actually. What do you mean by large-scale? How many people do you have to give this vaccine to for you to be able to generate the results that it protected 50% of people or 95% of people? Uh, the the large-scale clinical trials are currently being designed, um, uh, but um, uh, I believe that the uh, trial in the UK is going to involve 10,000 individuals and uh, designs of clinical trials in the United States are probably gonna be around 30,000 individuals. So very, very large clinical trials. They really are. That must be really hard to recruit that many people, although maybe a lot of people are really excited to be in a vaccine trial just in case it works. Um, I think that um, uh, right now there is such enthusiasm uh, to develop a vaccine for COVID-19 quickly that uh, recruitment of large numbers of individuals for vaccine studies is not going to be the limiting feature. The question is to have the clinical studies being uh, uh, flexible enough to rapidly deploy in the hotspots of where the epidemic is. And so there will be many challenges associated with these clinical trials. One is not really the numbers, but the speed in which it has to happen. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, having the trial design being um, uh, flexible enough. So if there is an outbreak in a particular region of the country or the world or a state or a city, then the clinical trial teams can be there when um, be there to, to show efficacy of the vaccine in the setting of actual transmission in humans. And you bring up speed. Um, partly, I guess, a trial can only go as fast as how fast a human will actually develop the immune responses and then maybe how often they get exposed to the virus. How, 
how soon do you think after you enroll the people, how soon do you think you'll have a sense of how effective the vaccine is? I think it's, uh, it's, a hard, it's hard to know, uh, but um, uh, uh, probably it will be within a couple months. Mm. Um, well, that's and, good uh, news. And, and uh, do you have any uh, safety concerns? So safety is something that's been talked about a lot. And the question is, um, in developing a vaccine as quickly as possible, will safety be compromised? And from my perspective, safety is the most important part about any vaccine, and safety cannot and should not be compromised. One of the reasons why uh, current vaccine designs are, are, are very large is to really gain a large safety database in a short period of time. So as opposed to having, uh, say, a third the number of people on a vaccine trial that might go three times as long, one could actually get the same safety uh, readouts from humans if you triple the size of the study for a trial that's gonna go three times as fast. In addition, for all the manufacturing, uh, the way the process is being sped up is, is not by compromising patient safety or product quality, but rather by trying to do as many steps in parallel as possible rather than in series. For example, many of the vaccine manufacturers are scaling up for mass production of a vaccine even before they know whether it works or not. Yeah. So there's a lot of financial and logistic risks that are being taken by the vaccine developers and the vaccine teams. Uh, but um, uh, in my view, safety uh, is not and should not ever be compromised. And once you have a vaccine, I'm going to take the optimistic view that it's going to work. Um, how do you imagine it's going to get rolled out to people? Are there going to be some people who are prioritized to get the vaccine first? Are there going to be other people who are a little bit more hesitant, um, maybe infants, because, you know, we might not have as much data? How do you see that rolling out? I think that it will largely be dependent on the vaccine platform, the safety record, the extent to which clinical trials were able to be inclusive of uh, uh, young, old patients with comorbid disease, et cetera. Uh, immunosuppressed individuals, but also the sheer production capacity, because the ex expectation is that the demand for this vaccine will be unlike anything else in history, uh, because there are 7 billion people in the world. And for herd immunity, a large fraction will need to be vaccinated if they're not already infected. So the need to uh, have a mass-produced vaccine at levels that have never been seen before in the pharmaceutical industry is going to be very real. So part of the answer as to how vaccines will be distributed is also going to be what vaccine vials are available at what points in time. And for certain vaccine platforms, it might be more easy to mass-produce them than others. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of investment in vaccine technology over the next uh, four to six months uh, as well. So uh, I, I, I suppose we will really see uh, which of the leading vaccine candidates uh, truly can be mass produced. And then um, if a vaccine is available at hundreds of millions or billions of doses, then, th then uh, there will be much less rationing of the vaccine than if only a very small number of vials are available uh, when the vaccine is um, authorized for use. Okay. Dan, uh, thank you so much for spending time today talking about your vaccine and just vaccine efforts more generally. Really appreciate your time. Uh, good luck with your development process. Thank you very much. Pleasure.